Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Don't ever run at your giants with your mouth shut. You need to run at them saying, I know who I am and I know who I belong to. I am a child of the living God. You are a liar and you will not defeat me. This is what God has said that I can have. It's a promise in his word and I will not do without the very best that God says I can have. Do you hear me? I will not give up. We need to be ready to stand our ground and to refuse to give up. It's never too late for you to begin again, but don't think for one minute that when you step out to try that the enemy won't take a step against you to try to drive you back. It might be a mental attack. It might be an attack even through people that you love who will tell you that you can't do it. I want us to learn a lesson this morning from a couple of men in the Bible, one of them, Nehemiah. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in the book of Nehemiah and jump around and look at quite a few scriptures, but there's a real story here that I think will help you. So Nehemiah chapter 4, stick with me. There's a lot of good lessons in here. So now in verse 8, we see that they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem to injure and cause confusion and failure. But because of them, we made our prayer to God. And we set a watch against them day and night. I love this. And you'll see throughout this thing, the enemy comes against them and they pray. The enemy comes against them and they pray. The enemy comes against them and they pray. Let's learn to pray right away and not delay. Pray right away and don't delay. Pray right away and don't delay. Pray right away and don't delay. Don't, right and don't, delay. don't wait until you pray. Pray right away and don't delay. And then, verse 10, the leaders of Judah said, now all the people are starting to get worn out. Now, now, Nehemiah is not only dealing with the devil, now his people are getting weak and getting worn out, and somebody's got to still be strong. Come on, Mama, do you ever feel like you're the only one in the family that's strong? I know how you ladies feel sometimes. You know, men are awesome, women are awesome, Women have got a lot on their plate sometimes. The kids want you, the husband wants you, your mother wants you, your aunt wants you. You know, it's like. <laughs> we take care of my mom and my aunt. One of them's 90, one of them's 86. And I mean, it's not like I don't have anything to do already. And <laughs> I mean, I got three calls from the nursing home. I mean, I never go on a trip and I get a call from the nursing home. And you know, sometimes it, it starts to wear me out. But I can do whatever God wants me to do through Christ who strengthens me. Don't start saying, oh, I can't. It's just too hard. You say, I can do whatever God wants me to do through Christ who strengthens me. So now the people around him are starting to get worn out. Somebody had to stay strong. When somebody has to stay strong, let it be you. Everybody say right now, I can be the one that stays strong. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now, watch verse 10. And the leaders of Judah said, the strength of the burden bearer is weakening, is weakening, and the burden bearer is weakening, and there is too much, there is much rubbish, and we're not able to work on the wall. And our enemies said, now they start repeating what the enemy said. Don't ever repeat what the enemy said. Talk about what God said. And our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come into their midst and kill them, and we are going to stop their work. And when the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us, and I love this, 10 times. You get that? They said to us 10 times, you need to leave this work and come over here and protect us in our villages. I want you to understand that it's not just that the enemy works against well-meaning people. You're trying to do something you believe God has asked you to do. You're trying to stay focused on this thing, whether it's homeschooling or whatever it might be. You know, you, you can feel that God wants you to be a homeschool mom, and you're trying so hard to focus on that. And there's always something that's trying to get you to lose your focus and make demands on you to leave that post and come over here and do something else. 
Does anybody today have trouble focusing and staying on what you think your assignment is? Come on, we've all got an assignment. It's hard sometimes to stick with your assignment. Neighbors who were living out in villages who didn't really care that much about the wall being rebuilt, now they get whiny because they've heard about the enemies. They go to Nehemiah and the people building the wall, and they say 10 times, 10 times they said to them, you need to leave this assignment and come over here and help us. You better make a decision that you're going to stay zoned in on what God has asked you to do. You think I don't have to fight opposition trying to get ready for these conferences? I mean, there's a lot of preparation. You need to stay focused, 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 focused on what you believe your assignment is. How many of you lose focus pretty easy these days? There's a lot of things to steal your focus. I love that. Ten times. So I set armed men behind the wall in the places where it was least protected. I even thus used the people and families with their swords, spears, and bows. Now, if I were to read you the rest of this, which I'm not going to take the time to do, here's what you would find. They kept working. The enemy kept coming against them. They kept working. The enemy kept coming against them. He was determined to stick to his assignment. Then it got so bad that half of the men worked on the wall and the other half of the men stood guard against the enemy. We have prayer teams that pray at our ministry all day long, five days a week. I would not even dare to try to come out and do one of these things if I did not have people at home praying all the way through. Let me tell you something. We better appreciate the people in our lives that pray for us. I've got enough to do trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rebuild lives. I need somebody that's going to stand guard. <laughs> and then it got so bad, and I love this. Now, this is going to be so good. Then it got so bad, and you need to read the rest of this for yourself. It got so bad that they worked with one hand and kept a sword in the other hand the whole time they were building this wall. Now, you know what the sword is, don't you? It's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. So while you're working and trying to finish, you better work with one hand and keep the sword of the Spirit in the other hand, confessing the Word of God all the way through. I love it. Ephesians 6, where it talks about spiritual warfare, it ends with, well, it ends, ends in verse 18 with prayer. But right before that, it says, and wield the sword of the Spirit. That means speak and use the Word of God against the enemy. Don't ever start repeating what the enemy says to you. Use your sword and say what God says, not what the devil says. I've even had people come and say, well, you know, the devil, the devil is lying to me. I'm like, well, wait. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm confused. <laughs> You're up here taking my time. You've asked for my time to tell me that you know it's the devil and you know he's lying. And that you're upset and now I'm supposed to do something about it. If you know it's the devil and you know he's a liar, then why be bothered by it? We try to build you up so you can go home and stand your ground and defeat the giants that come against you that are never going to leave you alone unless you confront them and put them in their place. <laughs> David was anointed to be king, and many of you are anointed to be king in your own right. He was anointed 20 years before he wore the crown. Those 20 years were kind of like a mini nightmare. He was defeating giants. He had to face Goliath before he could wear the crown. He had to deal properly with Saul before he could wear the crown. Can I tell you a secret? I wouldn't just kind of off the cuff, glibly pray, oh God, use me. Oh, God, I want you to use me. <laughs> and then 
you come to me. Joyce, I'm the only Christian where I work, and I just don't think I can be there anymore. Can you pray with me that I'll get a new job because these people, I'm lonely, nobody eats lunch with me. It just, it's just bad, Joyce. I'm like, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait, I remember two years ago you asking me to pray that God would use you. Now you tell me he's put you in a place full of dead people and you're the only light there. And now you want to leave because you're uncomfortable. I'm the only Christian in my family. Well, good, at least there's you. And as long as there's you and you're full of God, there's hope. You know, if you stick with things till the end, you end up with a great blessing in your life. I want to just take you to one place and give you one example about Elijah and Elisha. Now, Elijah was a great man of God, but to be honest, Elisha did many more outstanding miracles than Elijah did because he asked for and got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. You know, sometimes you're working for somebody who's not too easy to work for. <laughs> As I hear low groans go through the auditorium. <laughs> you don't want to run away from everything that's hard because even though something's hard, God may have you there for a reason. There may be something for you to learn, something for you to get out of that. And so in 2 Kings chapter 2, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were going from Gilgal. And Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, Terry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The prophet's sons were at Bethel. They came to Elisha and said, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today. He said, yes, I know it. Be quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray you. Now, why did he tell him to be quiet? He was focused. Elijah said to him, tarry here, I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord your God lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. <laughs> so they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Do you not know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? And he said, Yes, I know it. Be quiet. You know, if we would just be half as persistent as the devil is. Did anybody hear me? I said, if we would just be, no, let's just be more persistent than the devil. You know what the word endurance means? To outlast the devil. Elijah said to him, now, see, three times Elijah tried to get Elisha to leave, and twice other people came and tried to distract him. And so he says again, verse 6, Elijah said, Terry, here I pray you, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. <laughs> and the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of prophets also went and stood to watch as the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the waters and they divided this way and that so that the two of them went over on dry ground. Now here they're walking through on a dry bed in the middle of the Jordan. That's not too bad. That's pretty cool. And when they had gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, I don't want just what you had. I want a double portion. Now, watch this. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. However, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it will not be so. Now, you know what I think he was saying? If you can stick this out to the very last minute. Come on, folks. There's a message here for you. If you can hang in there through every discouragement, through every lie of the devil, even when I'm telling you to get away from me, if you can stick with this because you know it's what God has assigned you, if you can stick with your assignment, then it will be as you have asked. And sure enough, Elisha stuck it out 
to the very end and he got a double portion of Elijah's spirit how many of you want a double portion blessing in your life how many of you want to finish your assignment in life then you know what you're gonna have to go through and not run away from now first Samuel chapter 17 And we're going to look first at verses 32 and 33. Now, first of all, you may or may not know the situation here, but just to catch you up to speed. All the men of Israel, the, the soldiers of Israel, were in a valley, and they were being threatened by a giant Goliath. And nobody wanted to come against this giant. Nobody. But little shepherd boy David, who knew his God said, why do you let this giant defy the armies of the living God? If nobody else is going to come against him, I will come against him. Well, the first thing that happened was Saul told him, you can't do it, you're too young. He came back with talking about what God could do. David wasn't really so concerned about what he could do. He knew what God could do. And we don't need to start looking at ourselves. We need to look at God and know that with God, all things are possible. Are you here today? I hope somebody in the building is being encouraged to press on. I hope somebody watching my television has got something big growing in you right now that says, I am not going to give up. I am going to get up. I am going to get up. I am not going to give up. I am going to get up and I am going to finish my assignment. Amen. So the first thing you have to do is ignore the criticism and the unbelief of others. 1 Samuel 17, 32 and 33. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight with him. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go. A <laughs> little bit of discouragement there. You're not able to go fight this Philistine. You're too young. And you have not been a warrior. And David goes on to say, I can do it. The second thing you got to do if you want to defeat giants is you got to remember past victories that God has given you. How many of you have ever had a victory in your life? How many have ever had a breakthrough in your life? You know, it would just be like double dumb for me at this point in my life to go, well, I, I just can't do that. I think I'm going to give up. Because I've got too many victories that I can look back on. Come on, when you get in a tight spot, don't just think about what you can't do. Look back at what you already have done. Look back at what God has already brought you through and delivered you from. Don't look at how far you go. You have to go. Look at how far you've come. And so David right away came back and saw, well, I remember the lion, and I remember the bear, and I took that lion by its hair, and I... It appears that he killed a lion and a bear with his, with his hands. So you've got to remember past victories. The next thing you've got to do if you want to defeat giants is you've got to speak positive words of victory and not words of defeat. 1 Samuel 17, 46 and 47. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Now, this was when Goliath was making fun of David. Ha, <laughs> who do you think you are, you little skinny, ruddy kid? <laughs> and David said, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will smite you, and I will cut off your head, and I will give the corpses... And I will give your corpse to the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Okay, now here's a statement for you. Don't ever run at a giant with your mouth shut. Come on, are you with me? Yes. Don't ever run at your giants with your mouth shut. 
You need to run at him saying, I know who I am and I know who I belong to. I am a child of the living God. You are a liar and you will not defeat me. This is what God has said that I can have. It's a promise in his word and I will not do without the very best that God says I can have. Do you hear me? I will not give up. And I suggest you get in a room and just let it rip. Get your mouth open and talk out loud. You all know how to do it. Just start saying the right thing. And then when you've got time, murmur the word under your breath. And don't tell me, ladies, you don't know how to murmur. <laughs> greater is he that is in me, driving up greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me I will show to be in the wrong. You can defeat your giants, and you can see the end fulfillment of your dreams, and I do believe that many of you are going to do that. I believe that God had you in the right place at the right time, on the right day, in the right city, at the right conference, and He does not want you to give up. He wants you to get up. He wants you to get up and say, I am going to go all the way through and be all that God wants me to be and have all that God wants me to have, and I will finish what I have started. Come on, get up on your feet and give God a big praise. Amen, 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 amen. Well, today you might be facing some kind of giant opposition in your effort to accomplishing what you really believe that you're supposed to be doing in life. But remember today that no weapon formed against you will prosper, stand your ground, speak the word over your life in the midst of your assignment from God. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer? Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, it's really great to have the ability to feed children all around the world. And I have a goal and a desire to keep feeding more and more all the time. This after-school feeding program serves an average of 90 to 100,000 hot meals per One year. One meal for these kids is, is survival. Well, I'm here in Thailand at one of our children's homes. You can feed, house, and educate a child. Hope Cambodia has been absolutely amazing. We've opened 15 different orphanages. And we're so grateful to be able to build this well here in Sri Lanka. We love to get clean drinking water to people. Well, so the water they're drinking is not making their children sick, and it's, it's not dirty, contaminated water. Yeah definitely feel in Haiti just the absolute desperation. I'm at the Cure Hospital in Malawi, Africa. A huge line of people who are waiting to see our nurses and our doctors. Many doctors and medical people have volunteered their time. We are in Summers Point, New Jersey. Well, today we're in, we're in Joplin, Missouri. We're here in Haiti in the village, and we're about to move people into brand new houses we've built. The winds were so constant with these big, big gusts. It was terrifying. 150 or more were killed. Thousands left homeless. Hey, you doing there, guys? Those gifts from Joyce Ryan Here in Zimbabwe, 
I was able to hand out the two millionth bag in a prison. That you can have a different life today. Don't know how many, you know, lives you guys saved by coming in and showing the love that you guys show. Human trafficking, today's term for modern slavery. We've been working in different parts of the world and providing a, a place for women to come out of that lifestyle and be restored. It, it, there's no limit here. This is, this is ran by God. He changes lives in Project Hope. You can change, you can get healing, you can survive. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. And so I'm inviting you to join us in partnership. Help us glorify God and share Christ. Help us help hurting people. Help us feed the poor and get the gospel to people that don't yet know what we know. You can check us out on JoyceMeyer.org and find out all that you need to know about partnership or you can call the ministry. God bless you and thank you for praying about this. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld.